Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. We're about ready to start a new book again, the book of St. Mark. Uh, Mark is a, in a Latin name, actually. It means um, Mars or a man of war. But his real name was uh, John, Mark John, and John meaning God's gift. And certainly he was a gift from God. And at the same time, he was a cousin to Barnabas, and he was a bit of a, a man of war as well. He, he uh, seemed to have a little bit of trouble getting along, but not too bad. His mother's name, of course, was Mary. You can usually find in Acts chapter 12, verse 12, you find about his whole genealogy uh, concerning his family. And his mother... Uh, Mark was not a, excuse me, was not a disciple, but he was a young lad that was with them quite a bit. Uh, Mark's mother was the house that Peter went to when he was released from prison or when the Holy Spirit allowed him out of prison. And so Mark was with them quite a bit. So you see this teenager that had experienced this and as it is written it's obvious that he was eyes on meaning he lived it he saw it he experienced it and it he was very vivacious uh, the word um, a noun or or uh, instantly uh, will be mentioned about 26 times in this book I mean it moves because uh, uh, of his youth and and uh, the fact that he was excited about the ministry. So having said that, uh, this um, youngest, who was probably one of the first Gospels written by, according to some scholars, let's go with it, chapter 1 and verse 1, and it reads, The beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, uh, this, this is a Hebraism, and it means from the beginning was the gospel, the good news. And it was even from the first earth age, if you would. And you have to take the blinders off that certain people would put upon you to see and to understand that God had a plan coming out the gate. And that plan of salvation came to fruition in Jesus Christ, which is Yeshua, um, uh, Christos, which is to say, God's Savior, the Anointed One, being fully interpreted, interpreted rather. Verse 2, as it is written in the prophets, from the beginning, yes, written, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And of course, he's quoting here from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 5. And um, naturally, we know that uh, he's leading up to John the Baptist here, as we know from Luke chapter 1, verses 15 through 17, that John the Baptist came in the spirit. He was not Elijah, but he came in the spirit of Elijah. As a matter of fact, Christ says in Matthew chapter 11, if you had received him, he possibly would have been Elijah, but they didn't. Why? They beheaded him. So here, here was this one that prepared the message, prepared the, the truth, uh, so whereby people could know and understand the seasons, the time, and the gospel, which is to say the good news. God's spell upon man, if man listens. Verse 3, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And that's the way it is, using the old plumb bob of truth, not altering here, not going there, but sticking straight on chapter by chapter, verse by verse, God's word in truth. For John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. In other words, um, uh, to have a change of mind. But a change of mind did not supply grace. Okay, That, that alone didn't cut it. Okay. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea. And, and the Greek is, says they kept going out. Not that they all went out at one time, but there was a string of them that continued to go out. And 
they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, meaning the descender, uh, confessing their sins. And it did bring about the remission of sins. But again, not grace. Verse 6. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with a girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey. And of course, Leviticus chapter 11, verse 32, lets us know this is the food of a prophet. Okay. And as, as well as 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 8, will tell you the same thing, that this is what Elijah wore. And um, in that 2 Kings, in that first chapter, uh, they sent out to take him captive, and they said, Thou man of God, you come down from there. And he said, If I'm a man of God, and 50 of them were struck dead. Okay. And naturally documenting he was a man of God. God had his hand upon him, and he was fulfilling that scripture before their very eyes. Uh, and here he was, quite a sight to behold. Verse 7 And preached, saying, there cometh one mightier than I after me, the latcheth of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. In other words, this is preparing the way and the truth for Messiah, the Son of God, Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. And this is why John would say this in such an humble way. Verse 18, I indeed have baptized you with water, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Spirit. I prefer spirit because the Greek word is pneuma, okay, and which means spirit. And uh, verse 9. And it came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in the Jordan. Now, a lot of people, because it says there is one coming, I baptized you with water, there's one coming that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, they would teach that you don't, you no longer have to worry or be water baptized. But then Christ, who set the way, the course for us, who showed us how to get it done, he was water baptized. Therefore, we should be water baptized. The word baptized comes from the prime, like as though you were dying a piece of garment. In other words, it must go all the way under to be saturated with the color of the dye in which you are dyeing it or changing the color, just as it changes a, a uh, sinner into a non-sinner when those sins are washed away. And therefore, Christ himself was water baptized by this one, this John, who was preparing the way of, of the gospel that was among us, that walked among us, where the actual word became flesh, as the first chapter of John declares, and, and did walk among us. Verse 10. And straightway, there's that word again, so vivaciously, means instantly. Straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens opened, and the Spirit, like a dove, descended upon him. What the Holy Spirit? And and what is this word dove? In the Greek, um, not so, but in the Hebrew, which is th these Hebraisms fall back to, what is dove in the Hebrew tongue? It's Jonah, which is the same as the prophet Jonah, Jonah in English. Okay, and um, that dove, which is always symbolic of that Holy Spirit. What, what, what does Yona mean? What is the prime? It comes from, the prime is Yayan, which is to say wine. And, and it, it, the etymology of, this, of the word means that it warms you. And it has that coo of love and understanding. That's what the Holy Spirit does. When it touches you, it warms your very being. And um, therefore, the etymology of Yona. And uh, I, I speak in the Hebrew tongue, okay, but which was symbolic of that Holy Spirit. Why? Because Jonah, the one named from the dove, would be three days and three nights in the belly of the whale. 
And this one, Yeshua Messiah, would be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. And they both would resurrect, Jonah being a type of he that was to come through that same spirit, Emmanuel, God with us. So, uh, that's going to depth concerning that dove, but it's a precious thing that God gives us these truths whereby we can see better into the emotions through the etymology of the very feelings of our Heavenly Father, His love. For certainly, when that spirit comes, it does not only change minds, but it brings that grace, it brings that love, it brings that warmth, whereby you feel that warmth and experience it at His touch. Verse 11. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And so it was the, credi the credentials given by God himself concerning this Emmanuel from Isaiah, uh, having quoted before from chapter 40, we go all the way back to chapter 7, where he would be that one uh, uh, where the virgin conceived and bare a son, we called him Emmanuel, which is to say God with us. Verse 12, and immediately, here again this youth, little Mark, brings forth this instantly, a noun we could even translate, the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. In other words, to what? To fast 40 days and 40 nights. He's showing us how to get it done. Okay. And to be tempted there of Satan himself. Verse 13. And, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days. That 40 is probation. Okay. Tempted of Satan and was with the wild beast. And the angels ministered unto him. And here he showed us the way. Uh, fasted and was uh, pr in prayer. And this is why he could withstand Satan, which is one reason that the, his disciples in another place could not heal a lad for having a lunatic, uh, spirit of lunatic, which means lunar is moon, and uh, meaning of Satan himself. And Christ said, you've got to go back to here to find out how to get rid of that sword. Not that you have to fast that 40 days, but you have to know what happened in the wilderness. Satan used every trick. He quoted scripture, Deuteronomy. He quoted uh, uh, the Psalms, 91. Everything, every promise. But he always twisted that spirit about, the truth rather, the scripture about 90 degrees. And I wonder oft times how many Christians would know by, um, and you'll, you'll find a complete report of this in Matthew chapter 4, okay? And how many Christians would be able to determine what Satan changed in quoting that scripture? Because Satan can quote more scripture than most Christians can, unfortunately. But Christ is showing you how you defeat him by chapter by chapter, verse by verse, line on line of our Father's Logos, His Word, that gives us the credentials and the ability to handle Satan or anything evil that comes against us. Uh, and as He will give us that example also in this same chapter. So, uh, there in that wilderness, He was tempted and He's the angels uh, protecting Him, He overcame. Verse 14, now, after that, John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee, the circuit, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, the king and his dominion. Well, who was that king? Well, he's king of kings and lord of lords. And his dominion is all of the universe. All of it, not just part of it. Verse 15, and saying, the time is fulfilled. I'm going to repeat that. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye, and believe the gospel. You believe the word of God, don't change it. 
uh, the experience you found in, in uh, the 40 days probation, that 40 days in the wilderness, well, Satan tried to change the word. He tried to mix it up. But you believe the gospel as it is written. And that's why you must always teach God's word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby you are not confused, whereby you have the authority of the powers God has promised those that do believe. And when was that? Well, it's time. He would soon defeat death where he, whereby you could say, Grave, where is thy victory? For it has none. Death has no victory. Death is none other than Satan himself. We overcome in Christ. Verse 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simeon, and that, that means a hearing, and Andrew, manly, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. They were commercial fishermen, okay? And, and they're plying their trade here, okay? Now, he did not have an altar call. This is the way it works with God's elect. It was no accident that he just bumped into these two. They were chosen before the foundations of the world, as it is written in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. He knew. What did he say? And Jesus, verse 17, said unto them, Come ye after me. And I will make you to become fishers of men. In other words, you're going, you come with me. And those nets you're working with, I'm going to show you how to weave a net of truth together that you can cast over men and those that wish to have grace and mercy and understanding. And they will grab onto that net and cling to eternal life. And um, your haul will be great. In other words, you will you will find those. Now, unfortunately, some people that claim to be fishermen have holes in their net. Why? Because they don't teach chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Because any time you do not teach what God says, what God teaches, chapter by chapter and verse by verse, you're going to branch off into what man teaches. And that's when you hit a stump. That's when, that's an old colloquial saying that means you're going to be stopped. God's not going to go with you down that path. Because that would be a man thinking he knew more than God. That won't work. You can't con God. You can't deceive him. And um, there it was that he said, you come with me. And I'll, you'll be fishing for men, not fish verse 18, and straightway, immediately, they forsook their nets and followed him. They, they didn't say maybe or why or give me a break here. They went. 19, and when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, that's the, the, the Greek for Jacob, the son of Zebedee, my gift, and John, Yah's gift, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. I mean, they, they also were fishers uh, and uh, commercial fishermen, that is to say, verse 20. And straightway, there's that word again, instantly, vivaciously, this scripture moves. He called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him to be fishers of men to weave a net of truth together, of knowledge and wisdom, whereby they could cover uh, and teach and capture men's souls and hearts with the touch of that dove, the Holy Spirit, to warm them, to save them, to give them hope and give them eternal life. 21. And they went into Capernaum, that's the city of constellation, uh, or compassion, you could say. And straightway, immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered into the synagogue and taught. And what a teacher he was. Again, bear in mind, this is the living word walking among us. And the living word teaches. What did he teach? 22. And they were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one that had authority and not as the scribes. Now, what does that mean? 
Well, how do scribes teach? Uh, a man with authority, that's why you teach God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, because you can declare with authority that is truth, for God's Word is truth. But the people who go, uh, who, who go by precedent, that basically is the way certain ones do. According to this great man and according to that great man, we come to the conclusion, but he never makes a decision because he never speaks or teaches with authority. Why, well, why, why can he? Because he, he, he doesn't know the truth. And is, the truth is simply before his face, the Word of God. But he would rather go by the precedent of man Unfortunately, we have slipped into that state of mind, and that is the reason we have so many sorry judges today, is they don't judge by common law, which common law comes from this law. They judge by precedent of man. And man never has had it right. Man coming out the gate from the very beginning has always been wrong, and God has always been right. So, therefore, this is why you have so many socialistic judges appointed and so many um, judges without authority that rule by precedent. That is to say what this man says or that man says, not what the law says. The reason we make laws is they should be obeyed and followed. But... Um, the reason we teach God's Word is God's Word is the authority. It should be followed chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Not a bunch of um, um, sayings of man. This man or any other man. God's Word rules supreme. God's Word is eternal. Do you know something? If you read Mark, uh, and when we get to the 13th chapter, do you know what it'll say there? That these ages will change. The world might even change, but the Word of God will never change, not from yesterday, not today, nor will it ever change in the eternity. That's why you never waste time studying God's Word. It's with us forever. It is the law, it is the authority, and it will always be with us. Verse 23. And there was in, and there was in their synagogue a man with a certain with an unclean spirit, and he cried out. Now you're going to learn the difference here in disease and, and demonic possession. They are two different things, and you must understand that. A lot of Holy Joes, get, you, they get someone with a problem, and they start uh, casting out demons when all the person is, is ill. And then there are those that may see someone that's possessed and think he is ill when he has a spirit. Okay. This is what we learned in that 40 days in the wilderness. Okay. What did he say? What was this one that was possessed crying out? Because it would be the evil spirits, the demon speaking. The evil spirit not a, was not a demon, but an evil spirit. 24, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with thee? Evil spirit certainly had nothing to do with Christ. Thou Jesus of Nazareth, art thou come to destroy us? Question. I know thee who thou art, the Holy One of God. Why did they know him? Well, because they're supernatural. You know, you have these people that claim a reincarnation, like I can remember... 400 years ago when I walked in Spain and this was my address, uh-uh, no, you, you did not live in Spain 400 years ago. But the spirit that is in you, the evil spirit that is in you, possessed a person there and speaks through you now if you claim such a thing. For there's no such thing as reincarnation, only the, the uh, possession of evil spirits. They are supernatural. Why did they know Christ? Because they knew him from heaven. They knew him from the, the Father himself. And that's why they were so frightened and knew that they had to obey him. And they know ultimately why they say, have you come to destroy us? Because there is a time coming when they will all be destroyed and they know that also. 
the evil spirit, though men did not recognize Christ, they certainly did because they were supernatural. Verse 25, And Jesus rebuked him, saying, Hold thy peace, that you muzzle your mouth, and come out of him. Verse 26, And when the unclean spirit had torn him, and cried with a loud voice, he came out of him. I mean, tearing all the way. Okay. And um, uh, this leaves no doubt that Christ has victory over that that is evil. <clears throat> because the spirit had no choice other than to come out. Verse 27. And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him. What, what have we got going? We, this man actually has power over the evil spirits. And do you know something else? If you're a believer, we know that in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, that Jesus gives you authority if you're a believer, and if you believe, and if you follow, he gives you the power and authority spiritually to have power over all of your enemies. That includes Satan. That tells you how to handle the lunatic. That is to say of the night, the moon, which is Satan. It tells you, he gives you that power and that authority. That's the beauty of being a Christ man, which is to say a Christian, is to follow him, to obey him, and to love him. We're, we're talking about things here that are not commonly taught necessarily, but it's very important. There is not an evil spirit behind every tree, but they certainly are in the world. I can guarantee you that. But then there are nothing that we have to be afraid of because we have power and authority over them through what? Through him, through the Lord, the King, and his dominion, whereby if you are a servant of his, he gives you that power and that authority, the same power and authority that he used here. What happened then, verse 28? And immediately, there's that word again, his fame spread about throughout all the region round about Galilee. I mean, naturally, that word of mouth that spread, this man actually cleansed this one that was possessed. 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered into the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. They went in. 30. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick of a fever, and a noun, a noun is the same way, immediately, same word in the Greek, okay? Instantly, they tell him of her. Now, this document, Simon is Peter, okay? Simon Peter, uh, who would be called also by Jesus Christ himself to lock this up, Bar Jonah, which is to say, son of the dove, okay? Uh, and... Um, uh, but this documents that Simon was married, that he had a wife, and he also had a mother-in-law, and the mother-in-law is not well. She has a fever, a high fever. Verse 31, And he came and he took her by the hand and lifted her up. And immediately, there's that word, vivaciously, the fever left her. And she ministered unto them. That is to say, she served them a, a meal, no doubt, and took care of them. Just that quick. Now, the thing is, I want you as a Christian to note the difference. Here we have Christ casting out an evil spirit. But also, just because she had a fever, Peter's mother didn't have a demon. She was ill. And he touched her, anointed her, and healed her, brought her back. In other words, there is a difference in prayer for healing 
and a prayer for casting out. Okay. And well, why am I emphasizing that? Again, because many so-called leaders don't know the difference. They do not have spiritual discernment and have to know the difference, let's say, between someone that has an epileptic problem and they brand it as a spirit. And it's not so. It's cruel. It's not kind. If you do not have spiritual discernment, you certainly have no business tackling a, an evil spirit. Okay. But if you be a Christian and you are founded and have this net of truth woven around you, which is to say the Word of God, then with that, through the Holy Spirit, automatically comes spiritual discernment. You can feel it. You know immediately when there's an evil spirit around. You, no one has to tell you. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have this talent or gift, and they take it as, well, I can be around somebody five minutes and I can figure them. That's discernment. Okay. So you have to look at things as they are in reality to have a good foundation in Christianity, to know and to love the truth, and to certainly know the difference. Because you can, you can really offend and really do damage. If you take a person that is ill, <clears throat> and you tell his family that he has an evil spirit, you make a fool out of yourself, and, and you make a fool out of the Word of God. Because it's not true. And you become a false prophet. So it is important that you be able to discern and to know the difference between illness, and you have both here, and he will continue that in this chapter. Don't miss the next lecture. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please?